a, a free fellowship meal from 6.30 to 7.15 on Wednesday nights if you can get here. Uh, and then Bible study and the youth are practicing for the Easter uh, production that's coming up uh, on Easter Sunday. If we want your child involved in that, if you, need, if you can get here, we'd love for you to be a part of that. So today we're going to continue talking about what the Bible says about what I'm, I'm calling the theme of empty. Y'all say empty. Empty, that the tomb of Jesus Christ is empty. And it's not because his disciples stole his body. The Bible is very clear that the stone that was rolled in front of the cave entrance was sealed and was guarded by the equivalent of Navy SEALs of that day, the Roman centurion guard. There's no way a ragtag band of scared and terrified Galilean men, mostly, we're going to overpower a guard, move that stone. It's just hogwash. Jesus really did rise from the dead. And one of the many reasons we know he rose from the dead is because there were so many people willing to die to say they saw him. Now, people will die for a lie. People die for a lie every day. But if you are in the position, you mean to tell me of all those people who saw him alive, nobody said, Okay, we kind of made some of that stuff up, just don't kill me. So today we're going to continue talking about, because the resurrection is the hinges that the birth um, swing on. Big things swing on little hinges. Little hinges, big things. I right now, and we're, most of you all know that I'm not a very good handyman. And I'm not going to call any names, but my wife's closet door has been wallered out from stuff being anyway. And so I took the door down, and it's one of those press wood deals where the, 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 the wood's gone. And, and I talked to some of my friends, and they said, put golf tees in there. So I put wood glue on the golf tee, and I, I, I tapped it in there real gently, hard on purpose. And so I've, I've let it, I told Miss Winnie I'm letting it cure and what I'm really doing is I'm working up the courage to try to put that door up again. Y'all ever been there before? Like you just soon gargle peanut butter or do something because that door's not heavy until you have to hold it and put a screw in that hole. And no matter how many, any of you grew up learning new words when you were holding the flashlight for your daddy, working on stuff, you know what I'm talking about? I know that I'm, I'm, and that's another thing, I'm debating whether I want to put my foot under that door and hold it kind of like, you know, kind of float it on my foot and then try to do the drill all at the same time without getting Jake involved. And I just don't see it ending good either situation. But hinges, the resurrection is the hinge that the um, birth of the Christ child swings on. It, it's an, it helps open the door because he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He's a personification of what God came to do and the price that was paid. Romans 10. So Paul's speaking to the church in Rome, the big olive. He said, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Let me stop right there. When you, when you look up the meaning of this words, I challenge you. I double dog, I triple dog dare you to go home and find out what these words mean in the original. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is your Lord. He is your master. You are his doulos, his slave. If you confess with your mouth, you are a slave of Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Go to 10, please. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. Your mouth will tell on you. Your mouth will tell on you. That's why when I'm in a weird situation, believe it or not, it happens. That's why when I'm in a weird situation, I'll keep my mouth shut and I'll just go, hmm, mm hmm until I figure out what's going on. I don't do a lot of talking. Because it's better people think you're a fool than open your mouth and prove it, the book of Proverbs says. It's better people think you're a fool than open your mouth and prove it. For with a heart, so it's a heart and a confession. Even in court today, if you go in and say, I did it, I'm guilty, the judge makes you adjudicate. He makes you confess on the record what you did before the whatever um, 
plea bargain or whatever you've worked out with the powers that be. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Did I put 12 in there, PJ? Thank you. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, will be saved. Now, oftentimes we think of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. John 3.16, when you, so, so people have this idea that if they believe in Jesus as the Christ, that means they are saved. Because the Bible says, whosoever believeth in him. Well, I believe in George Washington. Okay, I believe in Genghis Khan, right? You see where I'm going? When you look at that word believe, somebody say believe. The word believe that's used all throughout the New Testament is very complicated because how many of you have learned the hard way that words mean things differently in different cultures at different times? Let me prove it to you. Depending on what version of the Bible you have is Isaiah 7.14 says, Behold, a virgin shall bring forth a child, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, and that means God with us. It's a prophecy of the Christ child being born into the timeline of humanity. But some of the newer, trans, skewer, newer translations of the Bible say, Behold, a young maiden shall bring forth a child, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, they're both right. Three or 4,000 years ago, the word maiden was synonymous. Everybody knows what a synonym is, right? It's not something you put on toast. It means it's the same thing, a synonym. Maiden and virgin were synonyms. Fast forward four or 5,000 years when the casual reader reads Isaiah 7, 14, and it says, Behold, a young maiden shall bring forth a child, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. There are young maidens giving birth every day. In our culture, because the maiden is synonymous with female, a, a young female woman. And I, yeah, I said female woman because apparently you can be a female and be a man somehow. It's synonymous with that. So just because you read a word, it does not mean in your culture what it means in their culture. Right? In the English language alone, in America... To go up and down in a building is called an elevator. To go up and down in a building in England is called a lift. You could say you were raised differently. You see what I did there? You'll catch it later. You, just because a word, a, and words don't mean, and certain words mean certain things in some cultures. They don't, even hand gestures. I, I was 35 years old when I found out that American Sign Language is not universal. That this means thank you in American Sign Language. In Arab-speaking countries, that does not mean thank you. And I don't know what it means, but the man who's, who's from, who was from Palestine told me, he, I didn't want to know, but just not to do it to a Palestinian again. So I thanked him and shook his hand. We were good friends. But the word believe, somebody say believe. Whosoever believeth on the name of the Lord, belief in the Bible, so I, it doesn't take me long to preach, it just takes me a long time to get there. Belief in the Bible is more than mental assent. Belief in the Bible is more than mental assent. Thank you so much. Belief in the Bible is more than mental assent. I believe there's some kind of liquid precipitation falling from the sky. Okay? I believe that. But it does not mean that that's going to save me. Belief in the Bible is more than just saying, I believe Jesus is the Christ. And I think, I'm willing to be wrong, I think there's a bunch of professing Christians when Gallup or other people will call them up and say, are you a Christian? And they'll say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. That they think they're Christian and they've never heard the gospel before in their life. They think they're a Christian because they believe in God and Jesus. There are people who firmly believe and are willing to put it, willing to fight about it, that Jesus is Christ and they're never coming to church. Because I've never been taught the gospel. You don't have to go to church as a Christian. You get to go to church as a Christian. You don't have to go to church as a Christian. You get to because 
church helps pull the giftings out of you that God has given you and helps keep you accountable and helps you. Any of you ever spent a bunch of money at Weight Watchers before? Say amen. They do those stupid way. Excuse me. They do those weigh-ins every week, and then you sit around and pat each other on the back and say, "You did good. You lost two point three pounds." And and I was used to think that stuff's not necessary, but when you are in a group of people of like-minded people, it helps. When people get excited about you losing two pounds when everybody else don't care, that's exciting. Some of you ain't never lost two pounds before, I can tell it. But it don't take long to gain it. Belief is more than mental assent. Belief is professing with your head and with your heart that you have moved from mental assent to living it out. Hmm? I believe it all. And I'm going to walk it out through grace, through faith. The promises of Easter are not empty. The promises of the world are. That's where I ended last week. The promises of the world are empty, but the promises of Easter is that God's promises are not empty. The world will tell you things that are empty. Easter is the greatest time to remember that instead of promise that is full of emptiness, God gave us emptiness that is full of promise. Easter is the greatest time to remember that instead of promises full of emptiness, God gave us emptiness that is full of promise. It doesn't matter how much you spend on it. Would you please stay out? I normally work alone. It doesn't, did y'all enjoy it? It doesn't matter how much you spend on it, what you do to it. Um, can, can, I, can I mess you up? Can I blow your mind? Permission to blow your mind? You're not going to believe it, so go ahead and Google it. Cleopatra of Egypt. Cleopatra of Egypt. Everybody remember Cleopatra? She lived closer to the invention of the cell phone than she did to the building of the pyramids. Let me say it again because some of you all of a sudden are paying attention. Cleopatra lived closer to the invention of the cell phone than she did to the building of the pyramids. The pyramids were at least 2,500 years old when she was born. And the cell phone came out somewhere in the 90s, 1990, 2000, just to make math easy, 2000, okay? That's how old those... That's how old that place is. That's at least how old it is. Why am I bringing that up? Because if you really do your research, you'll see that there is water damage done to the Sphinx on the Giza Plateau near the pyramids. Last time I checked, that's a desert. That thing has been around a long time. Anybody here Anybody here eat salt with your food? Anybody here with your salt? Anybody you pay extra because it says sea salt? If it was made, unless it was, unless it was made in a laboratory, it's all sea salt. Just let that sink in. Unless it was made synthetically in a lab, all salt is sea salt. Because there used to be an ocean there, and now the ocean's not there no more. And the salt that was in that sea, they're digging out of the ground. So I messed y'all up. Y'all ain't coming back next Sunday, I can tell. I'm bringing that up because it doesn't matter. So you mean to tell me you, you, you got a $3 million house on the beach and you think it's going to be there for your great-grandchildren and there were seas in other parts of the world and now there's no seas anymore? They're finding seashells in Montana. It's not always been the way it was. I'm not saying you shouldn't have nice things. I'm not saying you shouldn't take care of your stuff. I'm just telling you, you need to be investing in your eternity, not in this world, future of this world. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible says a godly man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, his grandchildren. There's nothing wrong with leaving something for your grandchildren. If you can scratch something together, leave something for your youngins, do it. But the important thing is that the world offers these promises of this is a, how about this one? How about a lifetime guarantee on something? Ask Jeremy back there about these newer cars coming out with a lifetime transmission. You don't have to change the fluid. There's no place to check the fluid level because it's a lifetime transmission. But what they don't tell you is it's, it's the lifetime. So, so if it tears up at 60000 that's the lifetime of that transmission. What good is a guarantee when a company goes bankrupt or is sold three times? Right? Lifetime warranty doesn't mean anything. Right? Whose lifetime? 
and 99.9% of you will die in your lifetime. If you're wondering about that, uh, one-tenth of one percent is I'm accounting for the rapture because you'll be alive when he comes, so you won't technically die that way. But all of you, none, none of us are getting out of here alive. And the world offers us empty promises. God gave us emptiness that is full of promise. The biblical account of the resurrection are so important of those who made their way to that very early morning burial chamber with an empty tomb where he was crucified off in the distance and grave clothes lay in there looking for his body where it was laid. We must not forget the significance of it. The very fact that those things are empty and were eyewitnessed by so many assure us of the promises of God are real. These things associated with Easter marked by emptiness are full of promise because they could not hold Jesus. He could not be held captive to the cross. He could not be held captive to the tomb. And he was not even held captive to his burial. I have a, I have a, um, a, a devotional I, I had one time that, that I, I bring up every now and again. That y'all understand nails did not hold Jesus to the cross. The nails didn't hold him on the cross. It was his love for you. And it was his love for me. Nails didn't hold him up there. It was him paying for your sin and for my sin and for the sins of your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and your ancestors and your granddaddy and your great... It's the sins of the world were laid upon his shoulders. And the Bible says he could have. Somebody say could have. He could have called ten thousand angels and we know in one night it's in the old testament I, I forget what book and verse it is one night one angel killed i think 140 assyrian soldiers i think that's i think i'm don't hand me up and say ken only he's talking about we know that but it, it one angel killed thousands and thousands of men so what could ten thousand angels have done Mocking him, spitting on him, the nails did not hold him. It was his love for you, and it was his love for me. On that cross, the precious Son of God gave his life as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And at Easter, we look to the cross and remember it's empty. I've talked about this before. The, the significance of the cross being used as a celebratory symbol will be the equivalent of us walking around. You know, most of you have noodled out that the Goshen G has a cross in it. Because I want us to always remember it's all about the cross. It's all about the blood of Jesus. It's all about the salvation that came full and free, not by works that man should boast, but by the cross. And listen, the cross was a, a horrible instrument of torture. It would be like us walking around with an electric chair on my shirt or a church shirt with an electric chair on it. But the cross went from a place known as death, and we realize that Friday is over. And Sunday's here. And if you look close enough, you'll see the blood stains on that cross from the crown of thorns. You should go home and Google Israeli thorns or, or authentic crown of thorns. It, when, when we used to have Christian bookstores, sometimes they'd have them up on the wall, and they were very expensive because they should be. Hand-woven out of thorns from that part of the world. And it's not like the cuckaburs and the green briars around here. I'm talking about thorn. you know. Anybody ever seen one of these things? Anybody knows what I'm talking about? It's an incredible instrument of torture. And the Bible says they took that crown of thorns and pushed it down on his head. If you look close enough, you'll see the blood left over from around his head and from his hands and his feet. If you look close enough. If you look close enough, you'll see parts of his back, like hamburger meat, hanging on this 
rough-hewn green lumber that they beat him with something called a cat of nine tails, a bullwhip with at least nine strands on it with pieces of glass, sharp glass and rock. And they, the people who beat you were professionals. And they would do this and then they'd, they'd, they'd hook it. And then they'd pull like this and rip as they pulled it out. I'm not talking about just to any of y'all. You ever got a whooping growing up and sometimes you were a runner. My brother was a runner. And sometimes mom and dad would get him in the back because he wouldn't stand still. But that didn't stop him. And that back whooping hurt bad too. But we're talking about not only did he take the whooping. But the shredding as they pulled the cat of nine tails out. If you look close, you'll see an instrument of death and torture. But praise be unto God, not only is the cross empty, but also is the tomb. The Bible says the grave is empty. The good news is that Jesus is alive. And he did not faint from blood loss and regain consciousness in that tomb. His body was not stolen and an imposter pretending to be Jesus shows up three days later. He did not switch places with somebody the last minute and was never crucified. None of that hogwash is true. If you look, you'll notice that the cross and the tomb are empty. It is empty of his body, but full of the promises of God. It is full of hope for you and I and all of humanity. The empty cross in the empty grave means that we can be forgiven of our sins, hallelujah, on that cross, for he paid the price, suffered the penalty for the punishment of my sin and my shame and your sin and your shame and all sin and all shame. As the Word of God says, he was the lamb that was slain before the world was found, which means he already made a way and paid the price before you even born, and he fixed you before you ever broke. I know the more, I think the phrase is woke, our woke culture, our woke culture. And no matter how woke you are, your grandchildren will look back and judge you for the things you tolerated and allowed to happen. And the more woke our culture gets, sin is no longer called sin. It is politically incorrect to hurt people's feelings and tell them that they have sin in their life. Well, let me be politically incorrect. You are a low-down, sorry sinner. You know how I know? Because Ken is a low-down, sorry sinner. And I need the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God every stinking day, not just on Sunday. I need the Lord to forgive me of my sins, heal me from my past, deliver me from my addictions, my bondages, and my slavery, and lead me in paths of righteousness for his namesake, not because of works that I've done, but because I submit to him as my master. Lord, help me today. The simple truth, according to Romans 3, is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I don't want to offend anybody, but I don't care how long you've been saved. There's something you need to get right with God about. How do I know? Because you live in a clay pot, and we all have blind spots. And if you don't think you have a blind spot, ask somebody that cares about you what your blind spot is. And they're going to love you enough to lie to you because they don't want to make you mad. But if you keep asking them, they're going to tell you and you're going to be really mad because it's your blind spot. And don't come to me and say, Ken, you got so-and-so mad with me. No, I've already given you a warning. How do I know? Because church people have done it to me for years. They'll have just have one of them. Anybody ever been to one of them throw down Holy Ghost services? Everybody's crying. Everybody's ugly Pentecostal. You know what I'm talking about? They don't care if their makeup's running. They don't care where the bobby pins went. They've laid out in the spirit. They don't care. They don't care if their rags are wrinkly. I'm talking about ugly Pentecostal. And after service, they'll say, oh, pastor, that was so good. If, there's, if you ever see it, George, if you ever see anything in my life I need to do differently, please tell me that is a lie. Because when I say, 
Tom, you remember when we had, yes, sir, yes, sir. Woo, what a powerful move of God. I've seen the way you talk to your wife and you treat her like a dog. And they'll cut you off and say, look here, I'm old enough to be your daddy. I was here for you got here and I'll be here after you gone. And I'm thinking, you told me to, church people lie. Did y'all know that? I didn't know church people lie. My first church, St. Matthew, I ain't going to tell you who it is because you might know them. They, I was, the first 100 days I was there, Ms. Dean, they, they come to me and said, Pastor, I have to have a heart catheterization at Wake Med tomorrow morning. I had to be there at 5 o'clock. Don't come. Just pray for me. Miss Ruth, that was a lie. And I asked them several times because I'm kind of thick. I said, you don't want me to go? No, no, that's too early. Please don't go, Pastor. I just want you to pray for me. I said, is it the same day kind of a thing? Yeah, yeah, we'll just be up there and out, and we'll be done. It's the same day. Don't, please don't come. Please don't come. Just pray for me. I said, like a fool. I said, okay, well, you know my number. Get somebody to call me. That was a lie. And you know what I learned that day? I don't care what y'all say. If I can get there, I'm going to get there. If I got to swim rivers, if I got to climb mountains, I'm going to be there. Because now I want people to know if Ken could be here, he would be here. So if you say say something, you know, it, we always joke about it, it's an ingrown toenail in the emergency room. But if I show up for your ingrown toenail, you'll know if I could get there, I would be there if I can't get there. Everybody understand what I'm saying? I'm showing up. I'm going to show up. Now, I'm not showing up with Sandy Case. They don't say, well, you can bring her. I'm not doing it. I'm supposed to smile when I say certain things. If I'm on point that day and I have Sandy K, I'm not, probably not coming. But I'm going to do my teetotal best. Anybody ever done something teetotal? I'm going to do my teetotal best to be there as much as possible because it is important to the church. It's important to know what's going on. And we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I know that you have trouble lying because I have trouble lying. Well, Ken, what is Ken lying about? The Bible says if we are guilty in one part of the law, we're guilty in all parts of the law. And if I go 56 and a 55, that is lying, isn't it? Now it's getting good hunting. I can smell it. It's getting mighty still and quiet because I'm all up in your business. You think you're righteousness and above reproach and you're speeding. You know they weigh them cotton candy grapes by the pound and you eating them like they're going out of style in the buggy. You're stealing. You may keep going. You know you're taking copy paper from work. They don't pay me enough anyway. That wasn't the deal you agreed to. You're not perfect. You may think you're perfect, but you're not perfect. You order a water at McDonald's and get a soda pop. You ain't, you ain't messing over McDonald's. You're messing over your testimony. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I believe the Bible from cover to cover. There are people who will stand you down and tell you there is absolutely no way that a giant aquatic animal swallowed Jonah. And I, I'm not fighting with you about that. I believe it. Okay? Whether you say it can be done, you are not a fountain of knowledge. You are a squirt. I believe the Word of God. I believe that the Word of God is true and that it is true from cover to cover. And just because I've not seen it work it's all of itself out in the timeline of humanity does not mean it's not true. Like if you look it up, are you ready for this? Can I really mess you up? Everybody, raise your hand if I can mess you up. The Egyptians were, were, were studious record keepers. Hieroglyphics, papyrus, they kept records of everything. As of two or three years ago, there's been found zero mention of the Hebrews being enslaved in the Egyptian records. So people will say, well, there's no way that the Exodus narrative is true because if that would have happened, it would have been documented in their records. Anybody here know what you did with your tax tax record 10 years ago you're supposed to keep them 10 years anybody know where your stuff is from 10 years ago seven years okay <laughs> 
Well, pastors keep, well, this one keeps his 10, okay? Because I've been audited one time. And let me tell you what's fun about audit, being audited, nothing. Um, I, got, I lost my train of thought. Okay, so how many of you know where your stuff is for 10 years since it's supposed to be 7? How about 15? How about 2,000 years worth of history? How about just because we haven't found the record doesn't mean it doesn't exist? Are you listening to me? So I didn't read that. I didn't start researching the Exodus and say, well, shucks, they wrote everything down, but there's nothing written there, so I'm not going to believe it. That's, 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 that doesn't make sense. That's like, that's like um, you, most of you understand, it's only been a, like 150 years, which is two lifetimes, that we started to noodle out. You know, we probably ought to wash our hands after when we work on people on their insides. Y'all know that, right? There used to be, a, the, the, the theory of germs was it was spontaneous. And only within the last 100 or 150 years, they started deciding, you know, we probably ought to wash our hands when we'll be digging around somebody before we start digging around somebody else. We ought to wash our equipment every time. That's only been recent. That bacteria, viruses, fungi, fungi, however you pronounce it, all of these organisms that lead. So I grew up here in, if you go outside with your head, what you're going to get the flu. That is not true. The flu is not in raindrops. The flu is a respiratory virus. And that's why the doctor can't give you anti... Pay attention, now I'm preaching now. You don't even know I'm preaching. That's why the doctor can't give you antibiotics because antibiotics only work on bacteria. They do not work on viruses. Viruses are extra, excuse me, intracellular. Bacteria are extracellular. So if you get a virus, it invades the cell and cannot be killed by an antibiotic. So quit going to the doctor for an antibiotic for a virus because you are wasting your money and their time. The joke used to be if you have a common cold, without an antibiotic, you'll get better in seven days. And with an antibiotic, you'll get better in a week. And all you're doing is building up resistance to the good bacteria in your body. And that's a whole other sermon. I'm not getting paid anything by Dow Chemical to tell you this. I'm trying to teach you something. And I'm trying to help you understand that just because you don't see it and it's not happened does not mean it's not real. Anybody here, well, some of you have, seen bacteria and viruses in real life. Most of you have not, but you've seen their effects. Just because the Egyptian story of the Exodus has not appeared does not mean it's not there somewhere. Somewhere. I believe the Bible. I believe it all. I believe it all. Every 20 years, if you've been around the barn and you watch TV, you'll know about every 20 years they'll find a burial box because in the Middle East, oftentimes they will take the bones of their loved ones and put them in a stone box to help with burial space. They will find a they will find a burial box of a man who lived somewhere around 2,000 years ago, and it sure looks like it's the name Yeshua. Jesus on it, and they plant these seeds that, oh, maybe we found Jesus. And I look at that, and I say, today's a slow news day. And I keep on going, because watch this. Not on, it, it, any, Danny, do you know any other Dannys? Okay, how about that? The point I'm trying to make is, do y'all think maybe, there was somebody else named Jesus 2,000 years ago lived around the same time Jesus did. Yes. Yes, let me say it. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So just because they find a box from that time period with the name Jesus on it don't mean it's our Jesus. Right? Right? Slow news day. I believe it all. I believe it all. The Bible true from cover to cover. And as a result... We are not good people. We are sinners, and we deserve to pay the price for our sins. As a result, we are sinners who deserve to pay the price for our sins. But when you look at the empty cross, and you look at the empty tomb, and you see the millions of people who have gone before you, I'm not going to smile when I say this. I'm just going to say it. I'm supposed to smile when I say starring things, but I'm not going to right now. 
This church started with these four walls. This one, that one, these two. Some of you are old enough here to, some of the people here are old enough to know the founders of this church. And those people got up early, stayed up late, worked like dogs, most of them in agriculture, to go from these four walls to the brick campus, for this campus you see here today, without any significant prodding or just because of the leading of the Holy Spirit. Did y'all even know that in the back hallway back here, we have three classrooms upstairs? We have three classrooms upstairs. This church is primed and ready for growth. We're a, a, a mile from Interstate 40. People drive to Goldsboro to eat a steak. They'll come to church here if this is where they're supposed to be. They gave, and there were plenty of Sunday school teachers. There was plenty of Wednesday night children's teachers, workers. There were, there was a piano player. Are y'all getting what I'm talking about? None of them were any busier than we are. What are you prioritizing? If, if you are a Christian, your church should be a priority, not an, a happenstance coming about. Watch this. I'm not going to smile when I say this either. If just the Christian parents, are y'all ready? Can I offend you? If just the Christ, parents who were Christians would say to the coaches, Coach Johnson, my kids will be here Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday after church. Ball t ball, they would quit having ball games on Wednesdays and Sundays. I guarantee you they'd quit it. If just the professing Christian parents would say, we will be here and we will support it, but church is what saved our souls. Church is what kept our house together. Church is what keeps me accountable and helps keep me spiritually strong. And I'm not going to miss church. I'm not going to stay home. That is not an option. And it's not just to come in the building. It is about where we come to gather together to worship him and remember what he's done for us and the like-mindedness of gathering together. If we would be Christians, the world would change. We want to legislate morality. We want to say if we can get that feller out of the White House and get our feller in there, then everything will be fine. Well, let me prophesy. No, it will not. You cannot legislate morality. Oh, Ken, are you saying you're for that guy in the White House? We'll talk about that after church, but let me say in Spanish, no. But the point I'm trying to make is you cannot legislate morality. You mean prove it to you? Say yes. Not too long ago, we had an amendment to the Constitution. You know how hard that is to create an amendment to the Constitution? There's a bunch of hoops you have to jump through to create an amendment to the Constitution. And it outlawed liquor, I think it was called prohibition. That worked really well for our nation, didn't it? It meant well, but they tried to legislate morality. And before it was over with... You go home and look it up. You're not going to believe me. The federal government was poisoning the, some of the alcohol to catch people who were making it. And citizens were dying because they were, wanted to catch people breaking the law. And it was such a stink that they created an amendment to do away with that amendment. Y'all remember your civics class? If there's an amendment, you have to create an amendment. That's why everybody who's against the second amendment, there's a way to fix it. Create an amendment that does away with it. And they know they can't do that because there's too many Second Amendment loving voters. They're trying to go about it from the back door. Just in case y'all don't know, I'm kind of a constitutionalist. And you should be reading your Constitution and know what it says. It's not the Bible, but it's important. We need to know what's going on. And when you look at the empty cross, the empty tomb is a reminder that he paid the price. And we have to repent and serve him. Christianity. Let's talk a minute. Anybody ever heard the expression, the sinner's prayer? Anybody heard it, sinner's prayer? That is a convenient and a simplified way of going through the basic steps of what is outlined in the gospel, Okay. But the sinner's prayer is not biblical. Now, hear my heart here. D does, it, does, it, does it help lead you to salvation? Yes. But if you've ever seen it, they used to do it in the Gideon Bibles. Do they still do that in the Gideon Bibles? There used to be a sinner's prayer in the front, or some Bibles did. That is not theophanic. So, and even if it was, praying the prayer 
is the step. Jesus said, I, Jesus said many things. Je, come on in, Cameron, hurry up. Jesus said, I am the door. Right? Is that not what he said? I am the door. Now, what is a door? A door is an opening in a wall into something bigger. When you say the sinner's prayer and don't do anything at your church and don't find a church home and get planted in it, you're just standing in the door. I'm here. And you stunt your spiritual growth. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just saying you're standing in the door. Getting saved is totally different than staying and being saved. At South at Christian, watch this. I'm gonna say some big Theophanitos 50 cent words. Say 50 cent words. Oh, that sounded mighty weak. Say 50 cent words. Thank you. After you get saved, you are you are sanctified at salvation. You are being sanctified as you serve him as his master, as your master, and you will be sanctified when you get to the other side. You should, the last time I checked, the sign still said Pentecost holiness. Now we should be seeking to grow closer to God and not see how close we can be to sin and still be saved. Romans 5, as I mentioned earlier, says that while we were still yet sinners, because of his great love for us, he died. Any of y'all love your children beyond an understanding that you can understand besides me? I did not know such love existed until I had the Lord let us bar children. And I am not proud of it, but I will go completely off the reservation about my children. My wife and my children, please leave them alone. Beat up on me, cuss me, wag your finger at me, talk trash to me. Please leave my wife and children. I'm, I'm begging, please, please leave them alone. Because I am, I don't know the way it's putting it. I am foolish over my family. You hear me? I am foolish over my family. I joke with Miss Winnie all the time. I don't have time to train another one. Please act right. But the truth is, a woman would have to be crazy or hungry to come marry me. I ain't, some of y'all ain't never said amen before. Right then, you said amen. <laughs> and Miss Kathy said that's right, yeah. Um, gosh, I forgot what I was going to say. Y'all messed me up. That's okay. I am crazy about my family. Nuts about my family. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to complain. I'm going to probably, I'm, I'm going to complain. I'm not going to like it. But if my family needs something, I'm going to do it. You hear me? Everything rises and falls on leadership, and the Bible says that the man is supposed to be the leader of his house. And, and, and the way I, was, way I was growing up was you don't have to like it. Sometimes you just have to do it whether you like it or not. Amen? That's all about being an adult. You want to be an adult, you have to do adult things. Right? You ain't got to like it. You just got to do it. And as long as I got wind in me, we've had this discussion. As long as I got wind in me, we're going to have something on the, on the table. We're going to have somewhere to go. And I'm going to do my teetotal best. There's that word phrase again, teetotal. I'm going to do my, so I've told my people, I said, just in case y'all, if y'all come, if y'all come to the table and it's deer or squirrel, I'm just going to tell you the piggly wiggly's out of meat. Don't say a word, but you're going to be with something in your belly tonight. Right? Because there's a difference between being hungry and being hungry. You know what I'm talking about? Hungry? In three days that Himalayan possum starts looking good. Y'all ever had Himalayan possum? You find Himalayan in the road? Some of y'all get that later. While we were still yet sinners, God died for us because no matter how old you are, you are, you are a child of the Most High God. And just how crazy you are of your children, you cannot imagine how crazy is God for you. Just how crazy you are for your children. You will go without to make sure your children have what they want. They don't even need it. You'll go without to make sure they have what they want. What will the God of the universe do for you? I'll tell you what he'll do for you. He's, he'll die for you. Knowing that some of you will never accept the gift he extends to you. That's how good God is. While we were still yet sinners, he loved us and died for us. From the cross, under excruciating pain and torture, 
I'm going to close. At crucifixion, they'd lay you out, nail somewhere around here because the palms of your hands would not hold your body weight. So somewhere around right here, between the two bones, where those nerve bundles come in on purpose, one here, one here, and then they would bend your legs about six or eight inches, and most of the time nail your, both your feet through one nail. And so your choices are for all your body weight to be resting on that open wound in your feet, pulling down on the nerves of your wrist. And as you hang there in the sun, your body tires. And your back, like Jesus' back, was hamburger meat. And the weight of your body pulling down like that, oftentimes one or both of your arms will pop out of joint after a while because the muscles that hold them in have been strained beyond their capacity and they pop out. So when they do that, your pleural area, your chest cavity begins to crunch down and it becomes more difficult to breathe. Your heart starts pumping faster because it's trying to use what oxygen it has in your bloodstream. And for you to get a breath... You have to push down on that nail and pull up on your arms if they're not out of joint yet and go back down. And that's what you do for two or three days until you suffocate, until you die. As your back is rubbing up and down that green lumber and that crown of thorns on your head is anybody ever been to the doctor and the nurse starts digging for blood oh my mm. that crown starts digging because no matter how careful you push your back up and your pull your arms up you sure you know you know you're going to bump your head some that those thorns digging In the meat of your head. And while that was going on, under excruciating pain and ridicule, Jesus stilled himself, gathered a breath, and said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That's love. Those were not wasted words, but a passionate cry from the heart of our Savior, extending mercy and grace in one of the most terrible times of his life as a human. Stand with me and let's bow our heads. Father, in Jesus' name, pray with me, church. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, today for the cross of Calvary. Thank you, God, for the death, burial, and resurrection and what you've provided for us through you've made a way through Jesus Christ. Father, Lord, thank you, God for helping and moving. And today, Father, if there's somebody here who doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior and they'd love to come forward and receive Christ, I'd love to meet you up here and pray the prayer of faith with you and accept the gift of grace extended to you through the blood, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Is there anyone here today? Then I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he give you peace and joy for the journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Shake hands with two or three people and say, I'll see you Wednesday night at 630. You're dismissed.